successful examples of democracy and land reform, and they draw lessons for would-be reformers in both of these areas. For this discussion, I'm delighted to be joined by the authors of the reports. They are Patricio Navia, professor, professor of liberal studies at NYU and professor of political science at Universidad Diego Portales in Chile, and Michael Albertus, professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago and author of the book, Property Without Rights. And finally, Carlos Montes, senior fellow at the Legato Institute and also a visiting fellow at Cambridge University's Judge Business School. But before we hear from our panelists, let me give you a brief overview of the two reports and their connected focus on policies that create greater political and economic access for marginalized groups. The Democracy Playbook focuses on the centrality of politics to economic development and ultimately prosperity. To paraphrase Bill Clinton's campaign manager, it's the politics stupid. The societal differences between Denmark and Venezuela or the Democratic Republic of Congo have more to do with their different political institutions than with their underlying wealth. So liberal democracy is the key to human prosperity because it is not the only, not, not the only, not only the political system that guarantees citizens' freedoms, human rights, dignity, agency, including participation and governance, but also in situations under liberal democracy, citizens enjoy greater freedoms and the ability to lead more fulfilled lives. Now around the world, political leaders focus on winning and staying in power. And in most societies, they can generally do this with the consent of only a narrow group of essential supporters. These supporters are rewarded by political leaders with special privileges rents and monopolies, separating them from the majority of the population. Now, in contrast, in a full liberal democracy offers all citizens equal access to the state, to the rule of law, and a minimum level of political equality, allowing them to influence government's composition and decisions. But in transitioning to a complete democracy, these narrow interest groups we referred to earlier, and the elites, they tend to lose their special privileges which is rarely done voluntarily. So therefore, how in recent decades have countries managed successful transitions from dictatorship to full liberal democracy? And by comparing and contrasting successful transitions in Korea, Uruguay, Portugal, and Estonia with the contrasting experience of those countries where the transition has to democracy has been partial, such as the case of Chile, Peru, Indonesia, and Ghana, some clear patterns emerge. Firstly, the trigger to the end of dictatorship tends to be a crisis that undermines that establishment, the elites, whether a financial case and a crisis, sorry, in the case of Korea, or the collapse of the Soviet Union for Estonia. And then following the transition, the key to success was that the reformist parties were conscious of the need to maintain social cohesion while still reforming political institutions. And they did so generally by maintaining conservative economic policies and making gradual changes in the terms of redistribution and of course rewarding their own supporters. They shifted also away from personality driven politics to more programmatic platforms, facilitating their re-election and hence consolidating these new realities for all political parties going forward. Now in contrast, the political development of less successful transitions has been much more limited. These countries have tended to have weak social cohesion so, for example, in Indonesia, Peru and Ghana, this is because of ethnic and regional divisions, while in Chile, more because of economic inequality and perceptions of a lack of fairness. And in these less successful examples, political parties have remained weak, clientelistic and lacking in those programmatic platforms that the successful reformers established. And furthermore, the political elites have tended to continue to play predatory games with the rest of the population, benefiting only themselves. Now, turning to the second playbook on land reform. In some low and middle income countries, land continues to be one of the assets that most impacts the lives of the poor. Moreover, agriculture employs a substantial number of workers in these countries and is intrinsically linked to the large informal sector. And if agriculture workers can improve their livelihoods by securing access to land and property rights, they can gain greater political voice and better afford to educate their children and help them succeed economically. And the examples of Korea and Portugal, reforms of property rights also contributed to these countries' successful transition from dictatorship to full liberal democracy. On, on the other hand, in countries where land reform is not as comprehensive or as well implemented, 
notably Peru and Chile, they found it more difficult to transition to a full liberal democracy. Now, looking at these examples of success, successful land reforms, we can see some other patterns emerging. They were supported by national consensus rather than being imposed. They targeted inequalities rather than being motivated on ideological grounds. They were also comprehensive, and in particular, they provided secure property rights to the occupiers, including title deeds and clear processes for registration, unlike in some of the less successful reforms. And as a result, successful land reform has contributed to making the agricultural sector more competitive and productive, and also giving more people a stake in society. And furthermore, greater social cohesion, which has thereby helped these countries to embed their democracies. And this is the connection between these two reports. So with that overview, let me now turn to our panelists. And first to Michael Albertus. Mike, in your work on land reforms around the world, what are the patterns of conflict and inequalities versus social cohesion and political equality that you observe? And could land reform be seen as a tool to bring greater social cohesion and unleash the development of political institutions? Yeah, great question. So, you know, as a consequence of colonialism and, and feudalism and related dynamics, a small fraction of the world's population came to own the vast majority of its land as of uh, about 100 to 150 years ago. Though, of course, that depends a lot on, uh, you know, which country that you're thinking of. Um, in many societies, you know, 5% of landowners owned 80 to 90% of the land, and in some cases even more. The result was extreme social stratification, um, periodic rebellion, um, strikes and unrest, and authoritarianism that worked on behalf of powerful landowners. Landowners dominated and manipulated rural workers. They sought to undermine economic modernization, and they created close ties with um, security forces uh, to maintain the rigid status quo. Many countries have taken uh, important steps to reorder those patterns of power uh, ever since. So some have industrialized their way out of it. Others have conducted land reform of various stripes. Still others have uh, hemorrhaged um, people, their citizenry through emigration. Um, to other countries, right? So land reform was one of the more successful and stable ways out. Countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Ireland, Italy, and others took that path. Um, far more countries uh, than, than that pursued land reform, but many governments badly mismanaged it. So there's this irony at the core of land reform in order to achieve functional, well-balanced property rights that support development, governments first had to violate and reallocate property rights at a wide scale. Um, again, that required you know, either, either contravening or violating core elite interests or, or um, getting them to come along uh, and play the game. But the aftermath is indeed far more conducive to social cohesion because it levels the playing field of opportunity, it reduces inequality, and it enhances political legitimacy uh, and buy-in amongst uh, the population. And all of that is conducive to healthy and stable democratic governance. Uh, and it's more conducive to social cohesion and to social peace, which are critical antecedents to investment and growth. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Um, and let's pick up on that, that idea of social cohesion. So, Patricio, you know, as an academic and a political observer in Latin America, what is for you the importance of social cohesion and political equality in the development of political institutions? And are there any particularly salient examples that, that you'd like to draw, draw people's attention to? Yeah, um, for political institutions to exist, we must have cohesive societies. It's not enough that you sort of come to a country and give that country a constitution and then all of a sudden that country is going to develop um, political institutions. That just doesn't happen. For political institutions to be developed, there has to be legitimacy, there has to be cohesion. And that seems to be the big problem in Latin America. In fact, the region is one of the regions with the largest number of constitutions in the world. So they keep on refounding the country every, uh, every few years, but in the absence of social cohesion, um, those exercises end up being futile and unsuccessful. Now, cohesion comes about or um, strongly associated to inequality, right? So in the absence of inequality or when you have 
lower levels of inequality is more likely that you will have social cohesion because after all, everybody has some similarities, similar expectations, similar opportunities. With higher levels of inequality, it is more difficult to have cohesion. Also, because constitutions normally enshrine some form of inequality, some form of equality, that is, implementing those institutions becomes far more difficult when you have higher levels of inequality. So the history of the world, and this is why um, agrarian reform has been such an important unmet challenge for many countries um, in Latin America, particularly in the 19th and 20th century. Um, but the history of the region and the history of the world shows us that when you have high levels of inequality, it is far more difficult to have stable, permanent, legitimate uh, institutions. So it is somewhat of a condition um, for institutions to settle in, to have strong roots, that society is going to have higher levels of social inclusion. And inequality undermines social inclusion, not just because it creates societies that are very divided and separate, but also because it reduces the chances of upward social mobility. Um, when you have higher levels of inequality, it is far more difficult for people who are born at the low end of the distribution to move up in the social ladder, and that reduces legitimacy. And in turn, that also reduces the faith, the trust in political institutions. Great. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Patricia. So, Mike, coming back to you, if we look at Portugal or Estonia and Korea, these land reforms have been critical to the transition from dictatorship to full liberal democracies. Now, in your research, what have you found that has made those land reforms successful? And how have they actually sort of tangibly contributed to the development of political institutions in these countries? Yeah, so, you know, the, the before picture in Portugal, Estonia and, and Korea was was rather bleak and, and kind of consistent with what I, what I mentioned previously in terms of the, the patterns, sort of the broader patterns across the world. I mean, these were all societies in which, um, you know, the distribution of, of land holding was highly unequal. Um, and as a result, uh, social systems were, were highly, uh, were very hierarchical um, and there was very little social cohesion. Um, land reform really helped to change that picture. So in Korea and in Portugal, land reforms were successful in weakening the power of traditional landed elites uh, and clientelistic parties and, and helped to limit their you know, rent seeking amongst those um, parties as well. They also gave greater political power to previously marginalized groups along with secure property rights. So successful land reforms in South Korea in the late 1940s to early 1950s and in Portugal in the mid 1970s um, gave poor farmers and other low income groups a stake in the economy um, and, and greater political equality and a greater voice in politics. And those factors played a really key role in supporting the transition um, from dictatorship to full liberal democracy in those countries. You know, similar pro uh, processes took place in other countries. So, for example, Japan and Taiwan and East Asia after World War II and, and Ireland and, and Italy and Europe. Italy was a little bit later. Well, about the same time as those previous ones, just after World War II, Ireland was was earlier, sort of started in the late um, 1900s. Late, um, 1800s and, and sort of finished up in the early 1900s. This also took place in Estonia. So at the end of World War I, the government expropriated a previously powerful um, ethnic minority out that was, you know, that, that dominated a lot of the, um, the countryside, and that was Baltic Germans. And this happened under an emergent nationalism that transcended social class and that turned its back on, on communism. Again, all sort of at, the, at this kind of short moment at the end of World War I. Um, these, land, these successful reforms all took place under rather special conditions. They were the result of an overriding factor that made them almost unavoidable, and they were carried out by states with at least some implementation capacities. Um, successful land reforms were mostly implemented as a, as a radical way of addressing um, external or internal wars and threats under the support and influence of powerful 
external actors, at least in, in many of these cases. So, for example, the United States played a critical role in Korea um, and what ultimately became the European Union played an important role in Portugal, not, not initially in terms of um, the redistribution of land, but subsequently in terms of consolidating property rights. Those reforms did not always uh, yield advances in democracy um, and, uh, and political institutions overnight. Um, but land reform helped to support and deepen na nascent democracies um, in Portugal and Estonia. Um, you know, authoritarianism persisted for several decades in South Korea after its first major um, property rights. But when democracy later arrived in the country, secure property rights helped it to take root uh, and deepen quickly for some of the reasons that I mentioned previously. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So, Patricia, I mean, you are a deep experience in Chile and Peru. Um, I'm just wondering, as you look out to other countries, such as Uruguay, Korea, Portugal, Estonia, as we've just been discussing, what relevance do you think their experiences have for both analysis of Chile and Peru, but also perhaps the way forward? And if I think about Peru having weaknesses in the political institutions, Chile although doesn't, but why can't these countries emulate the equivalent of Frente Amplio in, in Uruguay and provide that pathway to consensus and reform? Yeah, well, there are differences as well as similarities, right? Uruguay is a much smaller country, both in terms of population and territory. Um, Peru has a longer history, a, a more important history of social exclusion of indigenous minorities. Um, Chile had a rapid process of urbanization in the 1960s and 1970s, um, and eventually the economic reforms of the 80s and, and, and 1990s. So there are some differences as well. Um, the, the interesting thing here is that probably about 10 years ago, people would have mentioned Chile more than Uruguay as the more successful case of democratic consolidation and economic growth um, in Latin America. But Chile still had high levels of inequality. So whereas Uruguay historically had lower levels of inequality, Chile, a country that grew faster um, for the past 30 years than, than, than Uruguay, still had a problem of social exclusion with high levels of inequality that are probably behind or is probably behind the social riots, the uprising in 2019, and the kind of fall of grace from um, fall from grace of Chile um, in terms of being sort of the example that everybody uh, should follow. So the example we should take from Chile is that even though the country was pretty successful over the past 30 years in terms of economic development. Um, reduction of inequality or the reduction in inequality was not quite as sustained. In fact, it or only marginally decreased and social mobility was also very, very limited, something that Uruguay had solved earlier on. So perhaps the cautionary tale we take from Chile is that you can have rapid economic growth, but as inequality levels remain high or they don't go down quite as fast, then the problem continues to, um, to stand as a threat to the long-term sustainability of um, economic development. Uh, that's exactly what we see in Peru today, right? Another country that experienced rapid economic growth, particularly since uh, 2000, a lot of people mentioned Peru as the, the example of rapid growth um, over the past 20 years, but levels of inequality and social exclusion um, in Peru remain relatively high. And that probably explained the election of President Castillo in 2021 and the subsequent uh, political crisis that we have observed in Peru and that we continue to observe. So the lesson to be learned from Uruguay is that they solved what seems to be the biggest problem in Latin America, and that is the persistent levels of inequality and social and economic uh, exclusion. Um, South Korea, perhaps, is a better um, case to look um, as an example for um, Latin American countries than Portugal and Estonia, in that um, it is a bigger country. I mean, Estonia is a million and a half people. Um, Portugal is about 10 million people. So they might be a bit more comparable to Uruguay, a country of three and a half million people, and far less comparable to Peru, more than 30 million, and Chile closing in on, on, on 20 million people. But 
um, Korea, South Korea, just as Uruguay, also made significant success in reducing inequality and promoting um, social inclusion, social and economic inclusion. And that seems to be the big lesson that the case of Chile and Peru uh, leave behind. You can have rapid economic growth, but if that doesn't go together with social, political and economic inclusion, that growth is not going to be sustainable in the long term. Great, thank, thank you, thank you. Mike, can I just pick up on what we've just heard from Patricio and, and really ask you maybe to focus in a little bit about South Africa, because you, you've hinted that there have been some good elements to the reform there, but given the level of inequality and the incomplete nature of the reform, I'm just wondering whether you know we can flip this around and say what lessons or what warnings might you have for South Africa from these contrasting experiences in, say, Chile and Uruguay? Yeah, I would say that South Africa is in a little bit of a difficult spot, right? Um, so on the one hand, since the end of apartheid, it's made some considerable um, progress in terms of the, the redistribution of land and land reform. But, you know, unemployment is, you know, nearly a third of the, the workforce. Um, the inequality is still extremely high in the country. Um, and it's sort of its political institutions are kind of creaking under the weight of this kind of unraveling of the social fabric, right? Uh, you know, people had very different expectations at the end of apartheid than, than what has ultimately transpired thus far. And so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of debate that's going on right now, and there's there's pressure within the, the ANC and from outside of the ANC as well, um, that is to say the, the ruling party, to push land reform even farther. But I think that they have a very kind of narrow channel that they have to pass through. On the one hand, if they don't do enough, they risk this, um, you know, sort of maintaining this kind of uh, rigidly unequal status quo in which there are a lot of people who are disaffected. Um, on the other hand, if they go too far too fast, the obvious cautionary tale is Zimbabwe next door, right? So they don't want to go that route either um, and, and, you know, force away investors and, um, and, and domestic investment as well. And so they have to really um, kind of string the needle, so to speak. So it's going to be complicated for them. But, um, but I think that, you know, some of the other um, past that we've seen or some of the other examples that we've seen do do demonstrate ways in which uh, you can imagine South Africa pushing this farther. I, I will I will say one other thing, which is that, um, you know, of course, South Africa is a country that has um, been urbanizing a fair amount, right? So, you know, land is not is not the only solution, not even close to the only solution. So, in fact, a lot of the ways and one of the ways in which South Africa is dealing with land reform or dealing with, with um, you know, sort of inequality through an agrarian lens is actually through restitution and, and actually restituting people with in-kind payments rather than land on the basis of previous claims, right? So uh, again, you know, anything that is done in the, the rural sector needs to be paired with um, reform policies in the, in the urban sector. And they need to, they need to proceed um, cautiously, but not too cautiously, because I think if anything, they've been going too slow. Thank you, thank you. And now, Carlos, can I bring you in? Because you, having been involved in the research and the writing of both of these reports, have a, a unique vantage point of sort of comparing and contrasting some of the, the details of the democratic transitions with, uh, with land reform as well. So what struck you um, as being the real difference between the successful transitions and the less successful, both across the democratic domain and the land reform domain? Um, Yes, I think uh, um, Patricio focus on on the key link of institutions and how to develop these institutions. You you need and you have a, a, a basis of of social stability, uh, social cohesion. Um, that's a concept that we don't use very much, but I think it's critical on the work that we're doing. And similarly, what um, Mike um, the, the focus of Mike on how the uh, land ownership uh, uh, totally determines the the, 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 the the strength of different um, social groups. I think it's, it's, it's a key to understand the difference. So if we if we look at um, you know the the big picture, um, when we move from you know these scales that the economist intelligence unit has from authoritarian government to complete democracy, going 
through hybrid regimes and in complete democracies. Um, we kind of see that there is a concept of equality, but it's not just economic equality. There is a concept that is being used now, which is political equality, which is how people access this, this rule of law, um, uh, political accountability institutions, and the state. So the difference, you know, from one area of authoritarian governments to complete democracy, you know, we could imagine saying in the complete democracy, in fully rural democracy, everyone has a relatively equal access to the rule of law, to the state, and to political accountability, you know, in institutions. And, and obviously, that's a big move from an authoritarian, you know, hybrid and in complete democracy regimes in which when this does not exist, obviously it gives some power, some special privileges that become economic privileges, rents, monopolies, advantages to the elites. And therefore, the move from one system to the other is not going to be a, a voluntary movement. You know, it's not willingly that you're going to, you know, leave all those resources. Um, I think the work that we have used quite a lot is a, a colleague from uh, Patricio at uh, NYU, uh, Bueno de Mesquita. You know, he has a handbook of dictatorship um, where he explains, that, as you mentioned, Stephen, that uh, polit political leaders their key goal has to be to win power and to maintain power. And so we understand things through, through those lenses. And so the only way in which this transition happens is, um, number one, if the elites um, see, you know, obviously they see the pressure, you know, from the opposition, from the, you know, other groups, but also they see that this change, this conceding um, of, of their advantages um, is something that they could do because they see themselves as part of a country. You know, they see themselves uh, having, you know, a prosperity for all in, you know, in that. And I think that that partly explains, you know, how, you know, all these countries, Uruguay, Korea, Portugal and Estonia, you know, were able to make that transition. In the case of Portugal and Estonia, of course, it was a, a revolution. You know, and, and as Mike mentioned, um, the land reform was critical in developing um, the, the strength of the uh, land, um, land farmers um, and, 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 and initiating the, the, the transformation by allowing them to, to, to become part of the civil service, get, you know, get greater education. But in, in both Portugal and Estonia, uh, the changes were not just the land reform, but, you know, at the end it was a revolution, a revolution that ended a 50 years dictatorship in Portugal and in Estonia, a Soviet occupation. So there was a very, so, you know, a, a clear social cohesion. The previous, the former elites were removed and therefore, you know, it was relatively easy and not with a long, you know, not, you know, people say that institutions take a long time to develop. I think in the case of Estonia, it was the social cohesion and that, and that vision, that common vision of where they wanted to be, which meant away from communist ideas and the Soviet Union, that helped them to produce relatively quickly, you know, a strong independent judiciary um, and, 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 and other institutions. Of course, you know, we cannot forget that they had also the carrot of the EU membership that allow them to, to, you know, to, move, to move well. But I think in all these cases, uh, in the case of Korea and Uruguay, you had democratization processes that took 10 years, in the case of Korea and Uruguay, 20 years to move from, you know, let's say, an incomplete democracy um, with the transition of power to a, 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 a situation where the opposition won and they were able to have, um, let's call it a second democratization where these privileges and, um, and, 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 um, and special uh, access to, to all these political institutions were diminished. Um, and uh, the, the key of that was not only winning power, because you know, in a way, winning power is easy. And as Patricio mentioned, in Peru and in Chile, you know, leftist governments have won power. Um, but I think the trick uh, of both Korea and Uruguay is that they did it in a way in which they did not, they reassure the elites, if you want, the traditional elites. Um, they, they follow conservative economic policies. They had a very conciliatory leadership style. 
and and they 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 use opportunities to gradually reduce um, you know make structural changes reducing the privileges and monopolies of uh, and monopolies of um, of the elites. Uh, curiously enough, with the support of the IMF and the World Bank in in both cases, um, at the same time that they were doing that. They were increasing social welfare, social spending, minimum wages, which was also, you know, according to the Bueno de Mesquita sort of model, rewarding their supporters. And so, you know, that was the, you know, it's a fine line to, you know, to 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 uh, full uh, democracy. Um, and and obviously, Peru, Indonesia, and Ghana um, found their, I think, that ethnic divisions. Uh, weak social cohesion uh, and weak political institutions, an obstacle to follow that. I think, as Patricio mentioned, the case of Chile is a bit more special because technically they have very good political development. You know, uh, you know, he mentioned as well that one would have expected to do even better than Uruguay, and that didn't happen. And and when you look at the indicators, it's just institutional trust. I mean, not even so much, you know, inequality, but perhaps the perception of unfairness, that the one that you know has made it very difficult to to make that transition. So, so social cohesion, I think, you know, is something that we perhaps need to look at uh, more carefully in the future. Um, to be specific, as well, is the issue of leadership. Um, you know, we have at the moment uh, President Boric in um, from Frente Amplio in Chile. Um, and and one one wonders that if he had the 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 strategy the po the political strategy but also the conciliatory um, leadership style of uh, Uruguay's uh, Tabaré Vázquez, if the situation of Chile would not be different. Great, thank you, uh, thanks, um, um, Carlos, for that. Now, what I'd like to do is maybe just turn to Mike. Um, and really think about what way do you think a successful land reform that provides ownership rather than just use and provides that sort of financial and technical support for uh, for better farming is still an important tool to um, to today's world for improving the quality of democratic institutions and prosperity. And are there are there countries where you see this happening and, and being taken forward in the right direction? Yeah, great question. So governments in all of the successful land reform cases have not just redistributed land and left it at that. They also granted property rights, um, secure property rights to land beneficiaries, and they supported them with favorable investments in agricultural inputs and credits. And that yielded enormous benefits in the long term. It enabled farmers to invest in their children, for example, by sending them to school rather than keeping them on the farm. Uh, and within a generation, economies started to diversify and to develop, and that deepened over time. With that, political institutions continued to develop and deepen as well. So those basic ideas, I think, are still in play today. For economies to develop, they need to transform. Human capital is becoming what land was of the past. It's a necessary tool for um, personal, you know, for security and for advancement, but that doesn't come out of nowhere. It, it needs to be supported. A couple of countries making important steps in, the, in this direction, as I see it, are uh, Colombia and South Africa, even though they, they both face challenges as well. As part of Colombia's historic peace deal, it is restituting land to displace people and redirecting uh, other private land through government purchase to farmers. It's doing all of that while also providing property rights and technical support. And the process is not fast or easy, uh, and it has to address a very difficult past uh, rooted in conflict um, and, again, displacement. But it's making real progress, and it's helping to build social consensus. Another country taking important steps in this direction is South Africa. It's transferred millions of hectares of land back to black farmers that can trace their dispossession back to the colonial era. And it's providing most farmers with property rights and support. The problem in South Africa is that the process is slow. Inequality remains quite high, even as, you know, um, by some counts, almost as high as it was at the end of apartheid, and people are pushing the government to go farther. And I think until it does so, it's gonna be stuck in an equilibrium of partial prosperity and incomplete democracy. Great, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, I'd like to focus now a little bit on, in effect, you know, the learnings from this work uh, for future reformers. And I think the sort of first thing might be worth picking up is 
the sense of these transitions. So you know, under what circumstances there likely to be an opportunity for such a transition? We've we've discussed you know economic crises. We've discussed the fall of the Soviet Union. But I wonder, Carlos, if you could uh, maybe just reflect a little bit on some of the some of the sort of patterns or sort of as it were early indicators for reformers that there's a, a potential opening, a shift in the tectonic plate, so to speak. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think through doing this this work, um, what 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 came out strongly is that uh, it may be hopeful to think that countries are able to make political transitions in a simple way. Um, I think uh, one needs to look carefully at what's the uh, political structure or the strength of different groups um, and you know what what's the opposition to the regime i think that the opportunities uh, for change generally are are, are 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 quite limited i think uh, sometimes when when you're working with international organizations you're always hopeful that the next uh, president the next leader is going to be uh, different is going to allow this transition to a more um, uh, uh, reformist um, style. But I think people are constrained because uh, they, they 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 need to they need to reward their their essential supporters. If they don't reward their essential supporters, they lose power. So the game is over. So there is no point to be a nice uh, reformist government if you don't. Uh, real, you know, if you don't have the the strength uh, and the and the backers, uh, the political backers uh, of your regime. So I think the the a key lesson of of this work is to be very conscious on what uh, what's the strength of of political forces that allows you an opening in you know in um, uh, Ghana. Ghana is a is an interesting case because um, when Rawlings first got into power. Um, he was perceived as a, you know, a bit, you know, not just a dictator, someone that had used force uh, against um, against um, the, its its people, but also as coming someone from the left. However, because the support that um, the support that he had from ethnic groups was not strong, the only way to gain um, political support was by relying on external forces, by the support of the international. Um, monetary fund and the World Bank, and with that he was able to pursue like the first, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, Washington consensus reforms in Africa. So someone that was never perceived, but you know, so so there was an opening there because he needed to receive that additional uh, support in order to win power. Um, then later on, when um, when that changed, he he was able to. Uh, to get into a democratization process. So these are examples on, on how the, the internal situation and the strength of forces, you know, uh, uh, allows an opening um, for uh, reformist policies. Great, thanks. Thanks, Carla. So Patricio, to turn to you, you know, from your perspective, uh, what are your suggestions for what reformist leaders and indeed reformist citizens should be doing to promote the development of political institutions in their countries? That, that's a great question. <clears throat> now, I, I think one has to understand that this is gradual, right? So this is not going to happen overnight, um, but it can certainly begin to happen gradually. Uh, one also needs to understand that there are threats and there can be um, reversals, so there can be backsliding. Um, so one has to be prepared to deal with that backsliding. Um, you can make progress and then you can go, uh, you can backslide back to a previous situation. I think the example of Chile is, is a very good example. Uh, moreover, we can think of the late 1980s and probably the most developed democracy in Latin America, the case that we would have been studying in the late 1980s um, 
in, in, in this kind of instances that the Legatum Institute has uh, would have been Venezuela, right? So in the late 1980s, Venezuela was the most developed democracy in Latin America and probably the most stable one. Um, but probably a report like this in 1980 would have said, but Venezuela has a couple of issues, high levels of inequality, and it also depends way too much on just one commodity. Um, and, and perhaps there are high levels of corruption as well. Um, but other than that, Venezuela is doing great. And, and, and other countries in Latin America that are making the transition to democracy should look at the case of Venezuela and learn from Venezuela and apply some of the things that Venezuela has. And probably in 2015, we would have said, well, Chile is probably the most successful case. Uh, so countries need to learn from Chile. Uh, but Chile has two big problems. Um, high levels of inequality, and it depends uh, too much on just one commodity, copper, um, in this case. So there are some recurring problems that we see in um, Latin American countries as they uh, try to develop, and, and uh, those are associated with inequality. So the recommendation um, for the future for countries in Latin America, but also in the global south, is, well, you do have to take inequality seriously. And you have to take measures and implement policies that will reduce inequality in the long term. Maybe um, land reform is not the solution in all the countries, particularly those countries that have very high levels of an urban population. In Latin America, 80% of the population now lives in urban areas. Inequality is certainly higher in rural areas, but inequality, but um, land reform is not going to solve the problem for people in urban areas. Um, the real issue in urban areas is now human capital. So education is central. Um, if the big movement in the 19th and 20th century was land reform, the, the big priority in the 21st century has to be educational reform. You have to give people the tools they need to make in life, to be more competitive, to have uh, higher salaries, to be able to push themselves into the middle class and, and have more um, social and economic uh, inclusion. So reducing inequality but expanding opportunities for economic growth um, is central and in so doing educational reform has to be at the center of the reforms so let's just not focus on institutional reforms institutional reforms are important but um, we shouldn't just discuss the constitution or the electoral rules or decentralization we also need to focus on reforms that can make substantial improvements in terms of the quality of education and the quality of human capital in general. So pensions, um, um, health, but also transportation and the quality of life in cities is going to be important in generating lower levels of inequality, higher levels of interpersonal trust and trust in institutions, and that will make the economies more productive and it will also make institutions stronger. Right. So, so if people are able to derive dignity from, from earned success, in the past that was predominantly done through having good access to land and being able to utilize um, agriculture successfully. But as we move to a more urban society, earned success is going to go through having a good job, which requires um, education. That's the, that's the transition that you're, you're highlighting for us. Yeah. Great. Great. So let's... Um, Let's move towards a close. I think, Carlos, it'd be great to sort of think a little bit further forward to saying, you know, our argument has been that political inclusion, political equality, land reform are all parts of this journey uh, towards prosperity. And as you think about the research that we've done, you know, what are the broader lessons about how to apply these learnings to promote prosperity in the round? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I think that the, the big takeaways of this research, I you know, I will just focus on on five. Um, uh, I think that the first one is you know this understanding and this underscores everything that we have been discussing today is how politics, you know, although a, a dirty word probably not for Patricio, but generally for most of the population, a dirty word um, is still 
a key to prosperity. Yesterday I was with you know CEOs, Latin American CEOs in in a, in a workshop in in Cambridge, and I was saying businesses need to get into politics if the country is going to move to prosperity, um, and and they you know some of them reacted like yes, but you know it, it, it's something in, in in which you know we have you know there are too many risks, and of course, but uh, the, 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 the counter argument to that is obviously that political instability is, you know, is also a great risk for the country. So in the same way that we talk about economic development, agricultural development, I don't know, IT development, perhaps uh, this political development is, is, you know, is, is something fundamental that we need to be thinking. And in terms of what is about the rule of law, what is about political accountability institutions, what is about the state capacity, and now this concept as well of social cohesion as being, you know, underpinning all these all these elements. So that will be the the first uh, takeaway. Um, the second one, but related, is that these technocratic approaches that people have followed, where we ignore or you know don't pay too much attention to liberal democracy. Uh, democracy also has been used and mis misused because, particularly with the new authoritarian governments or fake elections or bad elections, everyone is called a democracy, but no one is a democracy. But if we focus on you know, the, the core uh, elements of a full liberal democracy, um, let's say voting plus uh, sort of element and, and with political institutions and conciliation and their pin in this, um, we would say, I think, following this report that, you know, democracy is not just a nice to have um, thing. It's not just something that rich countries are able to afford and others cannot. Is um, as you have mentioned, Stephen. It's the, the it's the system um, where uh, the only system that ensures the dignity and human rights of every system. So that by itself should make it you know critical, and it is for legatum critical of, of everything that we do. Um, but it also provides, as we are mentioning, an equal access or relatively equal access to the rule of law, accountability institutions, state capacity, um, and all that. Is allows you to to have prosperity and an open society and a, an open economy. So that um, that 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 is critical. And uh, more fundamentally, it's also in again with Bueno de Mesquita's analysis is the only system where the interest of political leaders are aligned to the interest of the majority of the population. It does not happen in other systems. So even if you have a selfish political leader, which you know they need to be to, to win power, to keep power, even then, you know, it's the, the, the views of citizens matter. And that's the, you know, and that's a, a really strong strength of 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 a full liberal democracy where the special privilege privileges for the elites, you know, do not have. The third takeaway will be that um, uh, donors uh, have traditionally ignored political issues. Um, and this can, you know, this effectively brings uh, more harm than, than good. Supporting dictatorships, hybrid regimes, and incomplete democracies, um, not paying attention what it, that, uh, what that uh, support does to social cohesion in the country can completely backfire. We have the, the case of Ethiopia in the past, the 30 years supposed to the, to the uh, TPLF Meles regime, where uh, uh, the situation was that last year they have an internal conflict as a result of that. Other countries like Rwanda, you know, can possibly become um, also, uh, 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 you know, a uh, uh, situation, uh, a difficult situation. Um, the fourth takeaway, um, would be that uh, we we often do not like uh, you know we say dictatorships, hybrid regimes, incomplete democracies are anomalies. I think the good the good thing of the you know the work we have done is that it shows us that no these systems make perfect sense. You know, in fact, they are stable. Um, they, we would not expect them to change unless they are. Uh, either an economic crisis, a change in strength, a change of foreign support, they are stable. They are the result, the result of political competitions and political leaders um, and their desire to win and keep power. Um, and, and, and I think it's important we understand this, this model in order to uh, 
uh, to identify the openings and opportunities to support reform reformist politicians. Politicians, as in the case of Korea or Uruguay, where you know they could be for the from the left, but they they are willing to um, to adopt conservative economic policies and gradual structural changes um, that um, that reduce. So 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 um, and finally, um, uh, it's a concept that Patricio made very eloquently at the beginning is the centrality of social cohesion. To prosper, to prosperity. Social cohesion is not something an institutional trust. It's not something that is you know we have um, uh, managed and you know and to study you know uh, uh, too much, particularly economists. But um, uh, but in a way, it is possibly the the, the key way to support uh, prosperity for other countries. Um, and because political development, and as Patricio uh, underlined, it depends in, 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 in many ways in, in, in on social cohesion. And so uh, if, one, if one wants to bet on doing something, it would be in supporting political leaders, groups that have uh, building social cohesion at their core so that they work on consensus, compromise, political negotiations to improve um, institutions. Uh, uh, so, so, so those are the people that you want to support and work with, not the ones that will prefer a more confrontational type of politics, um, you know, a more, uh, uh, you know, a more winner takes all um, uh, situation. And so within that, uh, as we have mentioned before, the Uruguayan uh, model of, uh, of a conciliatory politi political speech, maintaining economic stability, negotiate, negotiating um, structural changes that reduce the, uh, uh, the special privileges of elites and increase public spending and social welfare as a package seems to be a good bet um, to where, um, where we can find um, uh, prosperity. Thank you, Steven. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And my, my thanks also to, uh, to Mike and Patricio for all those uh, insightful comments. And, and to sum up, I mean, it's clear the pathway to prosperity you know, requires policies, as Carlos, you've just said, that strengthen social cohesion of the country. You know, and the pol politicians see politics as, as negotiation and conciliation, not, not simply a battle to be won. And I think as well that you mentioned about, the, about business it requires a population, whether it be civic society, individuals or businesses that also demands this from their, their politicians. Uh, and this can come through also in the way in which parties are, are regulated. Uh, and also, I think from our other work, independent electoral authorities uh, and those strong structures behind and underpinning and undergirding democracy are critical to this. Um, but I think what we see though, is that you know, if we get the politics right, and there's less predation, the economic engine can develop well, and those resources in the right political environment are deployed for the well-being of society rather than uh, the self-interest of the, of the elite. And it's that transition that land reform can, can also reinforce. But I think as Patricio has very insightfully pointed out, as we shift from a land-based economy to one where human capital is much more the driver of, of opportunity and dignity, education, particularly in urban centers, is going to become uh, increasingly important as well as a factor to, uh, to buttress um, democracy and prosperity. So in conclusion, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I, I hope you enjoy the reports. They'll be available now on our, on our website and um, look forward to connecting in the future as we continue this series of, uh, of playbooks for prosperity. Thank you and goodbye.